Okay, this is AQA, A-level physics, 2022, paper one, year one content. As per usual, can't show any AQA papers on screen, otherwise they will copyright the channel into oblivion like they almost did in the past. But links to paper and bar scheme are in the description for you to follow along. Question one, we have two stable isotopes, helium-4 and helium-3. So helium-4 is produced by a rock that has uranium makes sense. So we're being asked to give the alpha decay, of course, because of this is our alpha particle, so that's what's being produced. So we know it has to be that. So two, three, eight, 92. And we're told that it decays to thorium. And well, let's just say helium. We could put an alpha particle there, but we are talking about helium. So let's put helium instead. So just take numbers away. So the bottom number is going to be 90. Top number is going to be 2, 3, 4. Nice, easy start. That's what we want. 1.2, we're told that tritium can decay into helium-3. So super heavy hydrogen goes to helium-3. So what's going on here? Well, we're gaining a proton, but we're also losing a neutron for the mass to stay the same. So of course we have a neutron turning into a proton. And... Well, an electron as well. It shows that this is beta minus decay. And of course we have our anti-electron neutrinos. Well. I always forget about those. Probably because I don't think they exist. But anyway, there we go. So this is, of course, a weak interaction because there are leptons involved. If there are leptons involved, it has to be a weak interaction. So therefore, well, well, we have negativeness being taken away from the tritium nucleus in a sense. So therefore, it's a W minus boson. 1.3 we have an absorption spectrum, three absorption spectra. Before helium was identified, some scientists just yes, blah 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 blah. Okay, discuss the evidence for the suggestion that the lines in the helium spectrum are due to sodium and hydrogen. Are they correct? So firstly C is in both the helium and the hydrogen spectra. E is also. C doesn't line up perfectly though, so I'm not sure about that one. Mars scheme says it's okay, so. But E definitely lines up. It's both in the helium and sodium spectra. A, do you know what? I'm not buying that. I don't think they're right. If they wanted that to be right, then they should have lined it up better. Because if C is there, then A is going to be acceptable as well, but it's not. So I'm a little bit confused about that one. This is a dumb question. Blech. I guess we could mention A as well and B being similar and F being similar, but they're really not that similar. They're quite far apart. But I guess we should say that importantly against, and this is more likely going to be the case, isn't it? D not in sodium or hydrogen. And then also lines in hydrogen and sodium spectra missing from the helium one. I mean, I don't fully get this. Is this, are we saying that they knew that this is, did they know that it was helium or were they saying, oh, actually maybe it's just sodium, sodium and hydrogen in the sun? That is a terribly worded question. Silly AQA, whatever, moving on. 1.4, calculate in EV the change in energy level responsible for the spectral line E. Okay, so uh, of course energy level is just going down from there to there. Um, going down from the energy level to zero. This could be N1, N2, N3, we don't care. Doesn't really matter. All we care about is the energy drop. Now we're given wavelength, so therefore, we know that energy of a photon released is equal to HF, but we have wavelength, so therefore it's gonna be HC over lambda. I'm going to say that the wavelength responsible is 590 nanometers. So therefore, the energy is equal to Planck's constant times the speed of light divided by this here. We could cancel some powers of 10, but I don't think it's really worth it, to be honest. And that gives us 3 point, let's say 37 times 10 to the minus 19. But we're being asked for it in electron volts, whereas we've got it in joules. We know that the conversion factor is 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19. So we're going to be timesing or dividing by it. Well, of course, we're going to be dividing by it because we want a bigger number of electron volts. So 
that gives us, I'm going to say 2.1 times 10. And I'm going to say that gives us 2.1 electron volts. 1.5 explains with reference to processes, difference between emission spectrum and absorption spectrum. Ugh, okay. Right, so absorption spectrum results from photons of all wavelength or a range of wavelengths incident on gas, photons of energy equal to difference in two energy levels of atom are absorbed by an electron, by electrons, let's say, and they are raised. Let's just be bells and braces. These specific wavelengths are shown on the spectrum. So essentially you have a gas and you shine all wavelengths of light through, but it's only some of them that go through. And so this orange wavelength would show up on the absorption spectrum. Emission spectrum shows what wavelength are emitted when excited electrons release energy as they move from higher energy levels well, let's say if we from higher to lower energy levels. Again, we can say this difference in energy levels is equal to HF or equal to HC over lambda. There we go. Six marker there. 2.1, come 14 decays via beta minus. State the change of quark composition in beta minus decay. Well, like we said, well, we're going from carbon 14 to car to nitrogen 14 and so therefore we have a neutron turning into a proton now you know you should know that quark composition of a neutron is is udt up down down proton is up up down the nud and the pood so it's these two that are changing so therefore we can just say up down down to up up down there we go easy you get away with also just saying down to up. 2.2. .2. Oh, here we go. Yes. Explain how figure two supports the existence of the antineutrino. Mm -hmm. So we're told that the kinetic energy, it's a question like this in the uh, 2021 paper as well, funny enough. Uh, number of beta minus, we don't care about that. The point is that beta minus particles can have range of energy energies therefore showing that another particle also gains ek eg total energy is equal to the ek of the beta minus plus the ek of the antineutrino so we could say that total energy is constant or the maximum energy is constant, we might say. I'm not convinced, I have to be honest. Okay, identify particle X. Anti-electron neutrino plus a proton goes to a positron plus X. So let's use our conservation rules. Let's go with charge, first of all. Zero plus one goes to one plus, well, so this must be zero here in order for the charge to balance out. Lepton number, minus one for an anti-electron neutrino. Zero for that. Now, an electron is one because it's the OG lepton number, so actually a positron is minus one, so therefore, again, it must be zero, so it's not going to be a lepton, so I reckon it's going to be a baryon, so let's just check the baryon number, zero plus one goes to zero plus one, there we go. Strangeness, there's no strangeness, so therefore, it's going to be a baryon with no charge, it is going to be a neutron. 2.4, positron released is annihilated when it encounters an electron, that's what they do. Particle X can be absorbed by a nucleus, makes sense. It produces another gamma ray, blah, 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 blah. Okay, deduce which of these three gamma photons could have been produced by the positron annihilation. Okay, so we have an electron going in, we have a positron going in, and then we have, uh, of course, two photons coming out, so that's important. And so we could say the rest energy of the, I'll tell you what, I'm just gonna write that out, rest or mass energy same thing equals the energy of the photons basically energy in equals energy out now we could say that we could say the electron positron going in makes the two photons or we can just split the whole thing in half we can just say the energy of one of them
goes to the energy of one of the photons. We can just split the whole thing in half. Nice. So therefore we know that E equals MC squared for rest energy. And that's it. We're not dealing with frequencies or anything like that. So that's all we're trying to find. So for an electron, that's going to be 9.1 times 10 to the minus 31. That's its mass times 3 times 10 to the 8 squared. So 9 times 10 to the 16, essentially. And that gives us 8.2 times 10 to the minus 14 joules. Now, we have to say that this is the minimum photon energy. That is if the positron electron had no kinetic energy going in. So therefore, it could be any ones of these greater than that. So it can't be 5 times 10 to the minus 14. It can't be 6.6 .6 times 10 to the minus 14. Too slow, but it can be 1 times 10 to the minus 13 joules. So that's our answer. So G3. Question three, we have a pulley system to close a gate. We have various data. So 0.048, I'm gonna say that meters. We have a length of 0 0.23. We're gonna to have to find out its volume guaranteed and the weight is 35. Oh, actually, maybe we're trying to find out its density. Ah, yes, okay, so which of these three materials is used for A? It is a cylinder, so therefore we know that the, well, weight, of course, is going to be equal to mg, and mass is equal to density times volume. Uh, we know that volume is going to be area times length, and of course we know the area is equal to pi d squared over 4, pi r squared, but we've got d, so we're going to use that. So one more, pi d squared over 4, we need a length in there still though, there we go. Okay, so we don't need any of this stuff here, so I'm just going to rearrange it so we have density by itself. Therefore, density is going to be equal to the weight times 4, so 4w, divided by pi d squared lg. So that is 4 times 35, divided by pi times 0.048 squared times 0.23 times by 9.8. Big calculation. And that gives me 8,580 kilograms per meter cubed. So it looks like it's brass. 3.2, they're frictionless, which is nice. Calculate the tension in the horizontal cable C when the gate is closed. Okay. So we know the force pulling on these Oh, we want the tension in the cable C. How oh, very interesting. Okay, so like that, like that. Boop, 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 55 degrees and 55 degrees. And yes, we know we have it going around here, etc. We have the weight pulling down. But the important thing then is that that produces tension pulling that way like that. Now, if you have 35 newtons pulling that way, but also this one isn't moving, it's fixed here, then there must be also 35 newtons pulling in that direction as well because of course it's just one rope, isn't it? And so then that's pulling on here, we have tension pulling that way, it doesn't matter which way the tension is going, you get the idea that they will add up, as it were, to this tension in C. Okay, so we want to know what the horizontal components of this 35 newtons is either side, so therefore it's going to be 35 times cos 55. Now it's cos because we're turning through this angle to get from one to the other, and it with times in because we want a smaller number. We want the component. Of course, it's going to be double that, isn't it? Because there's two of them pulling on C. So therefore, 70 cos 55. And I do believe that gives us 40, let's just say 40 newtons. There we go. 3.3, pulley M is pulled to the left as the gate is opened, explain why this increases the tension in the horizontal cable C. Well, if it's pulled to the left, then that means that now the cables are going to be there instead, because now there's that pulley. So that means that the angle decreases, therefore less than 55 degrees. And if we just do EG, you don't have to do this, but if you did 2 times 35 cos 40, let's say, that gives us a bigger tension. So therefore, tension increased in C. 
I guess we should say one more thing. We should say therefore horizontal component of tension increased. 3.4, oh boy, moments this looks like. So boop, boop, like that. And we have a hinge like that. Let's pull it down there. Boy, this looks complicated. 12 degrees. And that is 0 0.95 meters. Okay, this is R. This is D. Yeah, this is C. The tension in the horizontal cable C is now 41 newtons. Okay. Calculate the moment of the tension about the hinge. Ooh, okay. So we know that moment is equal to force times distance, but these need to be perpendicular to each other. Force is line of action, we say, don't we? So therefore, if that's our distance there, then we're not looking for this tension here, no. We're looking for the component that is pulling perpendicularly to there. So let's just call that F. Therefore, F is equal to 41, but we're turning away from this 12 degrees. So therefore, it's going to be 41 times sine of 12 degrees. That gives us 8 point, let's say 8.5, let's say 8.5 to Newtons. So this is 8.5 to Newtons that's pulling perpendicularly. And so therefore, then the moment is just going to be equal to that times the distance. And that gives us 8 point, let's just say 8.1 Newton meters. So yeah, just a matter of finding the force that is perpendicular to the distance. Easy. 3.5, we now have stiffer hinges. What could we do to increase the moment? Well, of course, we could increase the distance by attaching it to here instead. Well, of course, we could have a larger tension, couldn't we? So there we go. I could say attach cable further from hinge or increase tension in the cable. So I guess we could say, how do we do that? By increasing the weight, the brass weight. Why is it brass? That's not really expensive. I don't know. It's four marks, so I guess we should explain them as well. So let's say for this one, increases distance. That force is line of action is from pivot. And then we just say increases force. Stop getting us to explain stuff that doesn't need explaining, AQA, please. Whatever. Electricity, we have this 12 ohms and also a bulb, which is 6.2 volts and 4.5 watts. Oh boy, we can find out a lot from that. So the battery, oh, we have an internal resistance. Well, what do you know? So 2.5 ohms there. All right, so the resistance of the bulb blah, 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 is about nine volts. So first of all, we just know that P is equal to, oh, not I squared R, because we have V, don't we? So V squared over R. We want to swap those two around. Therefore, R is equal to V squared over P, which is equal to 6.2 squared divided by 4.5. Hopefully, that gives us about 9. Hmm? A little bit far off. 8.5 ohms. Next, 4.2. Terminal PD is 6.2 volts right so v big v is 6.2 volts so let's crack out our emf internal resistance equation we know that emf is equal to ir plus ir where of course that is our terminal pd so therefore emf is equal to our terminal pd we have this we have this but we don't have a current so therefore Let's find out what the current is, just using V equals IR. This being the uh, resistance of all of this stuff here. So resistance of the circuit, so one over that is equal to one over 12. And this is why we were asked to find out just now as well, plus one over 8.5. And it turns out that R is then equal to, pretty much bound five ohms. Cool, current is equal to V over R.
So that is our 6.2 divided by 5. That gives us 1.24 amps. So we have our current. All we have to do is pop that back into our equation up here. Therefore, EMF is equal to 6.2 volts plus a current of 1.24 times the internal resistance of 2.5. And it gives us 9.3 volts. There's a couple of ways you can do that question as well. More than one way to skin that cat. 4.3, we now have a variable resistor in it. Don't know why. Boop, boop, boop. Okay. So she uses, oh, uh, this is a resistivity question, right. Okay, so we have a diameter of 0 0.19 mil. So I'm going to say that's 1.9 times 10 to the minus 4 meters. The length is 5 meters, and it has a resistance of 9 ohms. We've been asked to find the resistivity. Resistivity is equal to Ra over L. And of course, we have our area, so that's going to be R times pi d squared over 4 again. So I'm just going to put the 4 on the bottom like so. So that's equal to, let's say, pi times the resistance of 9 times the diameter squared divided by 4 times 5, so divided by 20. So let's pop that all in, shall we? And that gives me 5.1 times 10 to the minus 8 ohm meters. 4.4, two plugs connect the variable resistor. Movable copper contact, blah, 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 blah. Explain without calculation what happens to the brightness of the lamp as the contact is moved. So, if moved to right, R increases. Therefore, I through lamp decreases, therefore gets dimmer. Now, 4.5, we now connect the variable resistor in parallel. Oh, great, we've got to draw it again. That, that, and then that. Okay. Contact is returned to its original position. The lamp is dim. The contact is again moved slowly to the right. Okay, without calculation, what happens to the brightness of the lamp? Okay, so if this is a perfect battery without any internal resistance, it wouldn't make a difference because V would be the same, but V isn't going to be the same. So we can say due to R, V will change. So let's have a think about how that will change. So let's crack out our equation again. So epsilon is equal to, let's just do it this way around, I times R plus R. So epsilon is equal to, again, let's say V plus I R. Now this, of course, is going to be our PD across here, isn't it? That's our terminal PD. So therefore, if R increases, because we are shifting the variable resistor contact to the right, if R increases, I decreases. I decreases, then therefore, V will increase. Terminal PD will increase. Now, what's going on here isn't affecting this directly, isn't affecting the bulb directly, but it is indirectly because it's affecting the current flowing through the battery. So we can say I decreases through battery, let's say. Therefore, the terminal PD will increase. Therefore, finally, V for bulb increased Therefore, so will current, because the resistance is staying the same for it. Therefore, we'll get brighter. Question five, circular motion looks like. We have this, and we have a block on there. We have a distance of 0 0.25 meters. Okay, what are we being asked? So we have a, well, we have a radius, don't we, of 0 0.25 meters. We also have an angular speed, angular velocity, angular frequency, it doesn't matter which one you call it. It's so a 1.8 radians per second. And the block does not slip. Calculate the time taken for the turntable to complete one revolution. Well, we know that angular speed, angular frequency is 2 pi f, which is also the same as 2 pi over t, t being our time period. Therefore, time period, just swapping those two round, is equal to 2 pi over omega, therefore time period is equal to 2 pi over 1.8. And it gives us 3.5 seconds. Next, we're gonna to have to do some forces, we reckon. Uh, oh, okay, just draw on here. So it's going that way, 
There we go. We're going to have to draw the force, aren't we? Draw to show the direction of the resultant force. It is circular motion. The resultant force must be going just towards the center of the circle. Can be easier. 5.3. Calculate the magnitude of the resultant force on the block. Okay. So M is equal to 0 0.12 kilograms. So we know force is equal to mv squared over r or m omega squared r. And of course, we're going to be using that because we have omega, don't we? So just popping in numbers, easy peasy. So 0 0.12 times our angular velocity, angular speed of 1.8 squared times by the radius of 0 0.25. So essentially 0 0.03 times 1.8 squared. And that gives us 0 0.097 newtons. Easy. 5.4. Describe the evidence that a resultant force is acting on the block. Block's velocity is constantly changing. Therefore, its motion is not constant. So we can say not Newton's first law. Therefore, it is accelerating Newton's second law. There we go. 5.5. All right, pendulum, blah, 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 blah. Okay, so one rotation every 2.5 seconds. Simple pendulum so that it swings in phase. Calculate the length of the simple pendulum. Easy peasy. T is equal to 2 pi root L over G. We're looking for L. So therefore, let's do it one step at a time. T squared is equal to 4 pi squared L over G. So rearranging this to find L. Therefore, L is equal to gt squared over 4 pi squared. So just 9.8 times 2.5 squared divided by 4 pi squared. And I think that gives us 1.3 sig figs. Yeah, they've gone to 3 sig figs. So 1.55 meters. Probably should have put in here f equals ma. Whatever. 5.6. I swear they've done this question like loads of times before, but whatever. So we have the turntable. They're, they're basically doing the same thing, aren't they? Uh, in 2D, circular motion is the same thing as a sine wave, sinusoidal motion. Okay. Uh, air resistance affects the motion of the pendulum. Okay. Suggest this effect that it has on the amplitude. So nice and easy. So uh, we know that amplitude will decrease as energy is removed from the system. What about the phase? Well, T will decrease because it's not going as far. It's not going up to the amplitude that it was. So T will decrease. Well, we could say that frequency will increase, but not by much. Okay, so we have boop, and we have light ray, what is our normal? And then our light ray goes in like that and then it refracts like that and we have an angle here of 33 degrees okay so we have an n of 1.62 and an n of 1.35 this is a this is b this is p where it hits there over here whatever okay 6.1 explain how the path of the ratio is refractive index is a Oh, cool. So um, the angle of incidence here is that. That's theta 1. Angle of refraction is there, theta 2. So we can say that theta 2 is greater than theta 1. Therefore, light refracts away from normal. Therefore, its speed has increased. Therefore, lower refractive index. Easy start. 6.2 show that the angle of refraction is about 60 degrees. Okay, so we're gonna have to do some just angles here. So if that's 43 degrees there, then this angle here is going to be 180, take away 90, take away 43, and so that gives us 47 degrees. So if that's 47 degrees there, theta one must also be 47 degrees, cool. So let's crack out Snell's law, N1 sine theta one, is equal to n2 sine theta 2. We're looking for theta 2 ultimately. So let's just rearrange to get sine theta 2, shall we? So sine theta 2 is equal to, let's write it out again, n1 sine theta 1 over 
and two, so that is 1.62 times sine of 47 divided by 1.35, and then we're going to inverse sine that, and that gives us 61.4 degrees, let's say. 6.3 says draw on the diagram the path of the ray immediately after it reaches P. Justify your answer with calculations. Ooh, okay, so it gets to here. So we know that this is, let's say 61 degrees here. Oh, so this must mean that this angle here, so that means that this angle here is 90, take away that. So that's just going to be 29 degrees. And so therefore, well, this angle here is going to be 180 take away 43. So that's going to be 137 degrees. So therefore, if that's our normal there, good grief. So 137. So this angle here is going to be 180 take away 137 take away 29. And so that gives us only 14 degrees. Therefore, our angle of refraction going in, that's our theta one here, must be 90 take away 14. So that gives us 76 degrees. So theta one is 76 degrees. So here we go again, N one sine theta one is equal to N two sine theta two. N two is one in this case because it's air that's outside. So therefore we can get rid of that. And so we're looking for ultimately our theta two, we know is going to go Oh, hang on a minute. What's the critical angle, folks? It's going to be above the critical angle, isn't it? Mm, I don't think it's going to refract out. Shall we check what the critical angle is? He said like a CBB's presenter. Sorry about that. Shall we find out what it is? Yeah. Shut up, sign shots. Right. Critical angle sine of theta c, as it were, is equal to n2 over n1. n2 is 1 in this case, so it's just going to be 1 divided by 1.35. And so therefore, we find that the critical angle is actually going to be, yes, 48 degrees. Not even close, baby. So therefore, it is going to TIR back into the block. Oh, do we then have to? So do we have to have it coming out as well? Well, regardless, we know, well, we don't need to be super accurate, do we? But it says justify it with calculations. We know it's going to refract out because that is going to be less than uh, that critical angle of 48 degrees. Let's see what the mask scheme says. No, we don't have to do that. I think that's a little bit mean that, you know, they, they should have said, what does the question say exactly? Part of the rate immediately after it reaches P. Okay, so yeah, the implication is, is that we don't have to do it on the right side of the block there but you would be forgiven for thinking that you would have to. Multiple choice, question seven, which two units have the base unit? Kilogram, meter squared, second squared, ugh, okay. So kinetic energy and momentum, let's check kinetic energy. That's half mv squared, don't care about that. So that's going to be kilograms, meter squared. Yes, so that's correct, cool. What about momentum? No, momentum isn't. You probably should know that. Momentum, of course, is mv, and so that's kilogram meters per second. There's no meter squared or anything in there. So we can't be A. Young modulus, hmm, interesting one. Young modulus, of course, has the same units. Square brackets, by the way, means the dimensions of that thing. The dimensions of the young modulus is the same thing as the unit for pressure. And so that's F over A. And so that is, well, MA, I guess we could say, area. I don't think that's going to be right, is it? Because that's going to be kilograms, meters per second squared divided by meters squared. So no, that's not going to give us it either. So it's not A and it's not B. Hmm. Okay. You have to be a bit thorough with this one, don't you? Work done is energy, so force times distance, so force times distance. So that's also the same thing as mass times acceleration times distance, so mad, the dimensions of which are kilograms, meters per second squared, times by meters. So yes, work done is right, we would hope so. Uh, and we can see that pressure isn't right either, so therefore it's not going to be D, 
it is going to be C. The second one is moment of a couple. Moment of a couple is actually a force times a distance as well. So even though it is something completely different, it will actually technically still have the same units. Okay, which one is in order of descending order of magnitude? Descending means going down. So therefore, uh, giga pico milli, no, because pico is minus 12, that's nonsense. Mega giga, no, because giga is bigger than mega. Milli nano micro, no, because nano is smaller than micro. So it has to be D, let's just check it. Milli, micro, pico. So that's times 10 to the minus three, 10 to the minus six, 10 to the minus 12. And so therefore D is our answer. Nine, car travels at 100 kilometers per hour. What's the estimate of its kinetic energy? So 100 kilometers per hour is the same thing as, let's say one times 10 to the five meters per hour divide that by 3,600 and we'll end up with meters per second. So I'm gonna just say 28 meters per second. And so kinetic energy is half mv squared. So I'm going to say that the car weighs about a thousand kilograms, about a ton times by 28 squared. And so that gives me, so 390,000. And so therefore, what's that gonna be closer to? Yeah, that's gonna be closer to one times 10 to the six cars probably slightly heavier it could be two tons to be honest so it could be double that so i'm going to say the answer is b 10 was the specific charge of a carbon 13 nucleus specific charge is equal to it's the same thing as charge to mass ratio so charge divided by mass so that's going to be six protons so that's six times 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 divided by the mass which is well, 13 lots of, we can just say 1.67, 1.7, let's just say 1.7 times 10 to the minus 27. Popping that all into my calculator. That gives me 4.3 times 10 to the six. So yes, I was a little bit cheeky there with rounding the mass, but I think the answer is A. 11, which row describes the variation of distance with strong nuclear force? Okay, so we know we have, so we know we have this going on. And the range is about three to four femtometers. And where it goes from repulsive to attractive, that's about 0 0.5 femtometers. So let's check A, attractive beyond three femtometers, nah. B, attractive between 0 0.5 to three femtometers, yes. But then repulsive beyond three femtometers, no. There's no, nothing from there, isn't it? So C, attractive from, yeah, so it's gonna be that, so we know that. And so it has to be C, doesn't it? Because D says retractive up to 0 0.5 centimeters. That's not true. So it has to be C, 12. Which statement is correct. All strange particles are mesons. Note some baryons can be as well. They can have strange quarks. B, strange particles are always created in pairs. Yes, that is true, actually. In order for strangers to be produced, it has to be zero strangeness going to zero strangeness. It's a strong interaction. It's very confusing, but that is actually true. You have a strange quark and an anti-strange quark produced, for example. C, strangeness can only have strong interactions. No, that's not true. D, strangeness can only have a value of zero or minus one. Yeah, that's not true, is it? They can be plus one as well. 13, which combination of quarks is possible? Uh, well, it's going to be SU, isn't it? S anti up. Um, it can't be SD because that's a meson and they have to be a quark anti quark pair. Also can't be up down. Why can't it be this one here? Let's just check the charges. So we know a strange quark is minus a third, anti up is minus two thirds, and then down is also minus a third. So actually that gives us minus four thirds. That can't be true. It has to be an integer. 14, photoelectricity, EVS is stopping potential. What quantity is EVS? EVS is an energy of an incident photon. No, that's not true. Maximum kinetic energy of a photon, photoelectron. Yes, it is. Because once you have EVS, then you'll have no electrons being liberated from the metal surface. Let's just check C, threshold frequency times the Planck constant. No, that's the energy of a photon coming in that is the minimum energy coming in, and D, the work function. Well, that's the same thing, isn't it? 
15 fluorescent tube contains gas the coating of the tube okay a becomes ionized by the gas no it doesn't become ionized b absorbs photons of ultraviolet light yes sounds good from the gas and emits visible light yes that is true let's just check the other one c absorbs photons of ultraviolet yeah 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 from its no it doesn't emit photoelectrons we just want photons coming into the coating and it's emitting photons again after that but visible instead it's all several photons of a visible light no it doesn't absorb visible light it absorbs ultraviolet 16 which row gives evidence for the wave nature of electrons and evidence for the particulate particular okay fair enough okay so a electron diffraction yes so that's true and b has to be true there c can't be right d can't be right because photoelectric effect shows the particle nature of light photons let's just check the particle nature of light photoelectric effect yes that is true single slit diffraction that's again electron diffraction isn't it so it can't be b the answer is a 17 which one has the smallest de Broglie wavelength so we know the lambda is equal to h over momentum h over mv um, h is going to be the same for all of these things so basically if we want the smallest lambda we want the largest momentum largest mv so therefore uh well it's not really going to be an electron is it because well it's a lot lot smaller than a proton and the speeds aren't making sense with that one so it's going to be a proton it's going to be the proton at the fastest speed so basically proton fast so it's going to be d isn't it 18 longitudinal wave of frequency that and it has a speed of that what is true okay Shaman describes the motion of a particle in the wave. No, they don't travel at the same speed as the wave, do they? I mean, they might, but they're not traveling. They're just going up and down. We don't know that. B, it moves in phase with a particle in the wave 25 centimeters away. Ugh. Okay, so uh, the wavelength, of course, is equal to V over F. So that's going to be 0 0.5 meters, isn't it? It's half a meter. So therefore... No, that's not true either, because, well, we're talking about this particle here, this particle there. They're going to be doing the opposite thing at any given time. C, it oscillates with a time period of 1.5 milliseconds. Let's check that time period is equal to 1 over frequency. That's 1 over 660. And yeah, that is going to give us 1.5 times 10 to the minus 3, isn't it? So therefore that looks like it's going to be correct. Let's just check D. It changes direction 660 times every second. No, it changes direction twice that, doesn't it? Because, you know, change direction twice. You know how waves work, hopefully. 19, frequency, blah, 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 blah. Okay, this is going to be our nice equation here. What are we being asked? Tension is increased fourfold. Everything else stays the same. Which harmonic has a frequency of 2F after this change? Oh, come on, dude. That's such a jerk way of asking this question. Right, whatever. So the fundamental now is going to be double. Oh, so it is the first. Why would they ask it like that? <sighs> 20, light wavelength, 5.2 times 10 to the minus 7 meters distance is 1.5 meters width of 10 fringes is 3.5 centimeters so therefore the width of one is going to be 0 0.35 centimeters so in other words 3.5 mil so that is so that's 3.5 times 10 to the minus 3 meters quick out our equation so w is equal to lambda d over s we're looking for the separation so therefore, S is going to be lambda D over W. So popping that all in, it looks like it's going to be 2.2 .2 times 10 to the something, doesn't it? So I reckon I could eyeball this, but let's make sure just in case. That gives us 2.2 .2 times 10 to the minus 4 meters. So the answer is D. Diffraction grating and uh, lambda equals D sine theta. How many maxima? So we're looking at sine 90 so this ends up just being one so we're looking for n is equal to d over lambda so that's 2.5 times 10 to the minus 6 divided by 5.8 times 10 to the minus 7 so that gives me 4.3 
can't be 4.3, so it just has to be 4. But it says how many maxima have produced, and so therefore it's going to be central, 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 4. So actually it's going to be 9. So the answer is D again. So we have a plane, goes like that. So we're looking for how far north is it. So we're looking, of course, for this speed here. Speed is going to be that 150 times by cos 60. We're times it because we want a smaller number, and it's cos because we're turning it through the angle. And uh, we can just put it all in in one go. So distance is equal to speed times time. So that's going to be uh, 150 times cos 60, and then times that by 3,600, of course, because it's an hour. And that gives me 270 thousand meters or in other words 270 kilometers so the answer is a 23 ball is thrown upwards returns to its original position 2.4 seconds later the effect of air resistance is negligible let's say that it goes up to the top shall we let's find that distance and so i'm going to say suvet we're looking for that so i guess we should say s U is whatever, we don't care. V is zero, A is minus 9.8. Time is 1.2 if it's half of that. So let's use S equals VT minus whatever, whatever, it doesn't really matter. VT minus half 80 squared, you get the idea. So that's gonna be equal to, well, zero. So it's just half 80 squared, essentially. Half times 9.8 times 1.2 squared. That gives us 7.1 meters times that by two that gives us 14 meters essentially so the answer is c gosh 24 is a little bit complicated actually let's do this one step at a time shall we okay so we have a truck and we have a car right so if the truck and the car are accelerating at 2.3 meters per second squared that must mean well we don't really care about what's going on with this, to be honest. We only care about what's going on here. We have its acceleration, but the thing is, is that it's having to counteract the 1,100 newtons that's pulling in that direction as well. So actually, the force here, the tension, is going to be equal to MA plus 1,100 newtons. If it was going at a steady speed, then the force would be just 1,100 newtons. But we're adding on the accelerating force as well. So they've tried to fool us a little bit, which is fair enough. That's uh, what they're paid to do, I guess. So let's add those two up together. So that gives us 4,090. So, you know, 4,100 newtons. So the answer is B. So with F equals MA, you just need to be keeping your wits about you. What is our frame of reference? We didn't care about what was happening with the truck there at all because it's almost irrelevant. We had the acceleration of the car. We had the mass of the car. That's what we cared about along with the resistive force. 25, parachute descends at a constant speed, which law together with the parachute's weight make a pair according to Newton's third law of motion. So parachute coming down with, parachute is coming down weight is pulling down but it's the force of the parachute is pulling up the earth that is the opposite force there so actually it is c because of course that is true even if he was accelerating to the ground okay we have tennis balls drop from rest oh boy okay it bounces up to here okay oh boy this is interesting. Hmm. Okay, so we have a mass of 0 0.058 kilograms. So we are given a height here. So actually, you might want to do some suvat and things like that. Well, I guess you could. But uh, actually, if you see my video on this, I say if you're given height, then it's going to be to do with... There's going to be a question about energy, essentially. So the energy up here is MGH. So that is 0 0.058 times 9.8 times 1.8. So that gives us 1.02 joules. So anyway, let's do this with another color here. But if it's only bouncing up to here, then that's going to be 0 0.058 times 9.8 times 1.1. So that gives us 0 0.63 joules. Okay. Now there's a couple of ways that you can do this, but let's do it the long way around just in case. So let's find out the ball's speed as it gets to the ground. So E is equal to half mv squared. So V is equal to the square root of 2E over m. And so just doing that real quick. So square root of 
2 times 1.02 divided by 0 0.058 and that gives me 5.9 meters per second and then we have here on the as it bounces back up v is equal to uh, similarly but it's just 0 0.63 joules instead so that gives us 4.7 meters per second okay of course it's going in the opposite direction so we might want to call that minus doesn't matter which way around you do it so therefore change in momentum is equal to change in mv so actually that's just equal to m times change of velocity so that's going to be 0 0.058 times by well, 5.9, take away minus 4.7, so basically adding it on then. So 0 0.058 times by 5.9 plus 4.7, and that gives us a change in momentum of 0 0.614 newton seconds. Not a super easy question, that one, but like I said, if you're given a height, then it's ultimately a question about energy. So the answer is D. 27 mass m blah 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 so we had m on there but now we have 3m on there okay it has e okay so energy is equal to half k x squared or k delta l squared or whatever we're not going with half fx here because of course f and x are both changing so we don't want that we want something that has a constant because we can say then e is proportional to x squared I guess we could instead say that actually or e is proportional to f squared that is also true let's just go through this real quick so we know that the force is changing right the force is tripling we know ultimately that means that the extension is going to triple as well so we could just say that couldn't we but um, we could replace x in here instead we could say that's equal to f over k so also we could say that's equal to f squared over k and that's how we would get that doesn't matter point is is that the energy is multiplying by nine so the answer is d again 28 two wires blah 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 okay so this is going to be uh e equals fl over a delta l young modulus what's staying the same uh same material so same e same cross-sectional area right so we're being asked what happens to the uh, x yeah we're asking what happens to x delta rel whatever uh, let's replace that with x then therefore let's put x over the other side therefore x is proportional to f l okay so let's have a look at a stress in p and the stress in q are the same stress is force over area uh no the area is staying the same so that can't be true force is changing isn't it the extension of q is 2x uh i haven't actually written in what's going on here so 2l and 2f so actually no it can't be p either c the strain in q is double the strain of p oh okay so strain is delta l by l so we can say your modulus is stress over strain but Young modulus is the same, so therefore we can just say that stress is proportional to strain. Of course, that means F over A is proportional to strain, but because A is staying the same, F is proportional to the strain. Therefore, if the force is doubling, then therefore the strain is doubling as well. Therefore, the answer is C. Let's just check D. The value of stress over strain, which is Young modulus, for P is half that of Q. No, it's going to stay the same because they're the same material. Young modulus is the same. 29 the current in metallic conductor is 1.5 milliamps how many electrons pass a point in the conductor in two minutes so current is equal to charge divided by time also maybe we're looking for charge here so charge is equal to i times t so that's equal to 1.5 times 10 to minus 3 times by two minutes so 2 times 60. can i do that in my head yeah, I think so. So 3 times 10 to the minus 3 times by 60. So 180 times 10 to the minus 3. So 0 0.18 coulombs. And we're looking for the number of electrons. Though we know the charge of an electron is 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs per electron, as it were, if we were to make our own 
little unit. So if you do 0.18 divided by the charge of one of these bad boys, then we will end up with a number of electrons. And so therefore, I think that the answer is going to be something like 1.1 times 10 to the 18. So I think the answer is A. 30, which value of resistance cannot be made by combining 3 10 ohm resistors? Well, if we do this, then of course we can have 10 divided by 3. And so we'll end up with 3.3, so it can't be A. What about this? Well, we are going to have 1 over our total is going to be equal to 1 over 10 plus 1 over 20. And so that, is, and so that gives us 20 over 3, so that's going to give us 6.7. So it can't be B either. Then of course we have that in series with two in parallel. And so that's going to give us, well, 10, and then this is gonna to combine to five. So that's gonna be 15. So it's not gonna be that one. So it has to be D. It cannot be 25 ohms. 31, time period, 1.4 seconds, amplitude of 12 mil. What's the maximum speed of the particle? We know that V max is equal to 2 pi F A, omega A, but seeing that we have the time period, we'll go with this. And that's the same as 2 pi A over T if you replace frequency with 1 over the time period. So there's 2 pi times the amplitude of, let's say, 0 0.012 divided by 1.4. That gives us 0 0.054, so therefore it's going to be 54. Mil. So the answer is C or 54 millimeters per second rather. There we go. I hope you found that helpful. If you did, please leave a like. And if you really want to help me out, keep making these videos and buy me a cup of tea using the super thanks button. It goes a long way. And if you want to see the rest of these papers, then click on the card and it'll take you to the playlist. And I'll see you next time.